Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 171, and it's about signs. No, not street signs or mile markers, but the kind of signs that Ace of Base saw. And it opened up their eyes. They saw the signs. Life is demanding without understanding. And if you don't know what I'm talking about right now, you just don't know. And you can go to Spotify and look up Ace of Base. It's only like the greatest song of the year that I learned how to drive. And I spent many, many hours driving around listening to that song. Anyway, no, supernatural events of the 16th century and the way people interpreted them. But before we get started on that, I just want to remind you of a really good podcast that I've just discovered called The History of North America. And I think you'll be interested in it. It's a history of North America, not just the United States, but Mexico, Canada, and the United States. And the first couple of episodes this year are from our period and even a little bit before the Viking Age and stuff. But the Age of Exploration, Columbus, the Treaty of Tordesillas, all of that stuff would have been very familiar to our Tudor friends. They would have been following it. Um, there's an episode on England exploring the continent, John Cabot, and then he actually graciously shared part of my episode on the Sebastian Cabot map that we did a couple of weeks ago. So I think you'll be interested in checking out this podcast. I'm going to play the trailer and then we'll get started talking about signs. But History of North America, I'm going to play the trailer for you now. Check it out. I think you'll like it. Okay. And thanks to Mark for getting in touch and for sharing my episode and allowing me to share your work. The History of North America podcast is a sweeping historical saga of the United States, Canada, and Mexico from their deep origins to our present epoch. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this exciting, fascinating, epic journey through time, focusing on the compelling, wonderful, and tragic stories of North America's inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography. The History of North America podcast series is an incredible historical adventure that chronicles the thrilling, action-packed tale of a continent. I invite you to come along for the ride. Sounds like a good show, am I right? Check it out. All right, let us talk about signs. I think that we sometimes forget that before the scientific revolution, when humans began to really understand their world and the Earth's place in the solar system, galaxy, and universe, every event that couldn't be easily explained had to mean something. And before you start looking down on our Tudor friends for their ignorance and feeling all smug because of your advanced scientific knowledge, like, you know, you know about gravity and stuff, how many times have you avoided going underneath a ladder or blamed Mercury retrograde when your computer broke? So to a certain extent, we still do this today. So in this episode, we're going to talk about signs and supernatural events from the heavens and how our Tudor friends tried to explain and understand them and fit them into their world. In 1580, there was a large earthquake three days after Easter on the 6th of April. It didn't last very long, just about a minute, and it was strong enough to make the clock bell in Westminster Palace toll and buildings across the southeast were damaged. In Oxford, people wrote of birds fleeing and cows being frightened, and people left their homes going outside to try to avoid being hurt, which anyone who has lived in Southern California should know is not the best move, because you could be more easily hurt from falling building materials. Anyway, I'm quite chatty today, aren't I? (laughs) The earthquake was felt as far away as York and Cologne. People in the 16th century would interpret natural phenomenon like this earthquake as a divine message or an intervention from God to send signs of things to come. 
Of course, people on competing sides of various arguments would say that those were messages for one side or the other, especially with religious sides taking hold in the 16th century. As we would move on into the 17th century, there were attempts to sort of naturalize these events and fit them in with natural law and find more scientific explanations for them, which, of course, we would come to see the fruition of that by the time of the Enlightenment thinking of the 18th century, where everything was ordered and made sense and there were scientific explanations for everything. But in the 16th century, we were still at least a hundred years away from that, and people were still finding direct intervention and meaning in these events. I should say that in the 16th century, any event that was unusual in the physical world, like an earthquake or a comet, was known as a prodigy. This could cover, quote, strange eclipses of the sun and moon, terrible blazing stars, comets, conjugations of planets, quaking of the earth, tempests, vehement winds, and other prodigious signs contrary to the course of nature, according to Leonard Wright in his 1589 title, A Summons for Sleepers. These prodigies could be seen as signs of misfortune to come or prophetic messages of events to come. They could be the work of demons or witches as well, sent to confuse people into believing the wrong religion. These prodigies were all considered preternatural outside the order of the way things should be. We all learned in school that the Renaissance was this renewal of learning when ancient Greek and Roman texts were rediscovered, right? Well, one aspect of that was the ancient classical interest in prodigies. The Romans especially saw comets and earthquakes as events that would announce the fall of emperors like Nero. By the 16th century, authors were printing books and guides linking very famous supernatural events to later battles, harvest failures, famines, and deaths of important people to show the direct connections between the two. Protestants especially hung on to prodigies as signs of the fall of the Catholic Church. In 1523, Martin Luther learned of the birth of something called a monk calf, which was a cow born with a cowl. He saw this as the imminent downfall of the Catholic Church. But later Catholic writers would say that this same monk cow was a sign of Lutheranism come to destroy the church. In the 1550s, Protestants used examples of unexplained events as a reaction against the return to Catholicism under Mary. In 1552, a two-headed child was born. Of course, this would be conjoined twins. But the birth of these twins was later seen as a sign of the heads of Mary and Philip, replacing the one head of Edward. And a comet of 1556 was a sign of God's displeasure with England returning to the Pope, and also a sign of war, famine, and pestilence to come. The writings of the Stoics were also being read and circulated at this time, and the Stoics believed that fate caused all things to happen. Everything was part of nature and part of fate, so it was impossible for any event to happen that wasn't according to the master plan. Sort of like New Agey thinking today, where we're all connected and everything happens for a reason, and so nothing can be outside of nature or unnatural because everything is natural. So the Stoics believe that mostly these events were signs or messages that allowed humans to perceive the greater purpose behind the cosmos. Thomas Churchard said, if nature's law and reasons rule, no place were left for God. It's important to note also that many people believed that prodigies could be positive or negative. It wasn't always a sign of pestilence, war, or famine. It could, for example, mean the impending marriage of the queen or greater peace in the religious wars in Europe. Both of these were attributed to the comet of 1577. Many were already trying to move away from this thinking, though, and these interpretations. In 1560, lightning struck the steeple of Salisbury Cathedral just a few days before there was a new bishop, Bishop Jewell, due to arrive. 
And he thought that he was very, very lucky that he arrived after the lightning. Otherwise, so foolish and superstitious are men's minds that all of this mischief would have been ascribed to my coming. One institution that definitely had something at stake in trying to find alternative explanations for these events was the government, because they obviously wanted fewer interpretations from lay people about their policies. In 1569, the printer Edward Allen printed an English translation of a French humanist book on the history of prodigies, which urged people to search in nature the cause of these things and stay no more at these frilleries, deceits, and dreams. In 1532, Thomas Cranmer told Henry VIII about a comet and other supernatural events that were happening at that point, and he said, What strange things these tokens do signify to come hereafter, God knows, for they do not lightly appear, but against some great mutation. Of course, we all know what would happen after 1532 with Henry and Anne, so Thomas Cranmer made the right call on that. There were several major comets in the 16th century. The first really big one was in 1531. Now we know that as Halley's Comet. It was often associated at the time with the invasion of Hungary from the Ottoman Turks and the Siege of Vienna. You can actually learn more about the Siege of Vienna and the Turks in Hungary on the episode that I did. I did a series on the Tudor relationship with the Ottoman Turks. So that was about two or three years ago. I'll link to it in the show notes at uh, englandcast.com slash signs, englandcast.com slash signs. There was also a very famous comet in 1556 which, as I said, was used to attack the reign of Mary I. And it also portended a hot summer with much disease. The most studied comet of the time was 1577. This comet became famous because Tycho Brahe used it to take measurements on comets, including the parallax, and to help theorize on the origins of comets. It was also the 60th anniversary of the Reformation. And so many people believed that there was a religious significance to this comet. Those looking for a scientific explanation for comets often believed that they pulled up excess dust and matter from around the earth. And how long they would last and how brightly they would shine depended on all of the stuff from earth that they were pulling away. And these comets would often lead to hot summers with drought and famine because of the heat powered the comet, drying out the earth. Even those scientists who were studying the events thought that they were still sent by God. Brahe wrote in 1577 that the comet was an unnatural wonder of God by which he means to proclaim something other than what the natural courses might signify. Many Protestants at this point had very apocalyptic beliefs. They were convinced that we were in the end times and that the end of the world was coming. This meant that they saw comets as one more sign that we were in the end of days. They saw the comet as a blazing star or burning beacon set on fire by God's providence to warn the whole world of dreadful wars between God and those that do go on in wickedness. Earthquakes were related to comets because people noticed that they often happened close together. In England, there were comets and earthquakes that happened relatively close in 1077 and 1222, and some believed that the quake of 1580 that I started off the episode with was related to the comet of 1577. The earthquake of 1580 was short, as I said, it lasted only a minute, but it had a very big effect. Within 24 hours, a printer in London had a godly new ballad moving us to repent of the earthquake. Over a dozen new earthquake-related titles would appear in the following two months. Less than a week after the quake, the Lord Mayor of London called for the closing of all of the theatres, saying that the quake was an admonishment of how wicked and evil Londoners were by going to the theatre. The Crown, Elizabeth, also ordered prayers and fasting twice a week, and they saw it as a rallying cry to help drum up donations for the Protestant cause in France. Some Protestants also saw it as related to the arrival of the first Catholic Jesuit priests in England. But many also tried to find some natural causes. For example, one wrote, 
there was an abundance of wind, fast shut up, and as man would say, imprisoned in the caves and dungeons of the earth, which wind or vapors, seeking to be set at liberty, and to get them home to their natural lodgings, in a great fume violently rush out, and, as it were, break prison, which forcible eruption and strong breath causeth an earthquake. I'll end with a story about the 1572 supernova, which I talked about in an episode I did several years ago called Looking Up at the Sky in Tudor, England. In 1572, a new star appeared in Cassiopeia. It was a supernova. It was Tycho Brahe who studied it the most, and so it bears his name. The thing is, though, many were concerned that it presaged war, and there was actually a conventional belief of Jean Gosselin, he was the librarian to Henri III of France. He said that the star was a comet which presaged wars with England. Elizabeth wanted to really find out what it was. She invited mathematicians and astronomers, including Thomas Diggs, who was England's first true Copernican, to come and tell her all about it. So she wanted to kind of figure out if it really meant that war was coming or if something else was going on. So she invited all of her astronomers and mathematicians to come and study the comet and give her the news of what they thought. This supernova also made an appearance in Shakespeare's Hamlet several decades later, specifically mentioned by Bernardo in Act 1, Scene 1. Shakespeare experts have studied this and have come up with the conclusion that he would be referring to this supernova that he saw as a younger man because it made such an impression on everybody who saw it. Bernardo says, Last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to illume that part of heaven, where now it burns Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one. And then came in the entry of the famous ghost. So the supernova lives on in Shakespeare. So that's it for this week. I will have a link to all of the different notes that I used for this episode. There's not a particular book, but there's some papers. Um, There's a couple different articles that I use. So I'll have links to everything at englandcast.com slash signs. Let me know what you thought about the episode. You can always get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016-TESCO, 8016-839756. Or you can join the new Tudor Learning Circle, which is a free social network just for Tudor history nerds. That's at www.tudorlearningcircle.com. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you are having a wonderful summer. I will talk to you again in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye. Blow, northern wind, a sandful may be sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoot a board in Bauerbrick, that soul is Sam Lee's on sicht. Men's cool maiden of me, fair and frey to fond. In all this war, flesh a won, a board of blood and a bond. Never yet in Ustenon, not so merry in London. Oh.